What's up, Chiefs Kingdom? You are here on Chiefs Focus First and Ten. You got Caleb, you got JP, and we got Quentin on. We're going to talk some Mitchell Swartz. We're going to talk about some other things, crazy stuff going on. Hope you guys are all doing good. I'm going to pull my famous Eric the Enemy. Hope your family's doing well. I hope you're all doing well. Let's just get down to business. Uh, how you guys doing? Pretty good, man. Good. good. Yeah, all things considered, doing all right. Yeah, my Let's man go, Quentin. Quentin's got had COVID, so uh, and he's vaccinated, and it was it was horrid on him. So uh, kudos for him making uh, making the show and getting on. So we're happy he's here. Um, but uh, what about Mitchell Swartz retiring? You guys, what do you think? Uh, good for him. You know, uh, sad to see his career cut short. You know, he played. Um, you know, 10 seasons, uh, or nine seasons in the NFL. Um, it was definitely when he was playing, when he was in Cleveland for four years. And even when he played here in Kansas city, you know, he was one of the best, if not the best right tackle in the NFL, uh, did not uh, an iron man. I mean, the guy literally did not miss a game until the 2020 season, mm -hmm. uh, played all 16 games every single year. And I think at a position that's difficult in the NFL in general, no matter what position you play, because it's such a you know physical, hard game to play. But especially at a position where you are hitting 300 pound men hundreds of times. So, you know, kudos to him. Uh, if you follow him on Twitter, you can see the guys just traveling the world. I hope the best for him. Hope he comes back and lives in Kansas City. Um, but I think that. Mitchell Schwartz experience is one that Orlando Brown can pull from because yeah. nobody thought that his career was going, Mitchell Schwartz's career was going to end until it did. Mm -hmm. And I think that Orlando Brown can pull from this because personally, I think Orlando Brown is going to get franchise to stay on the franchise tag. I don't think they come with a long-term deal by the time you guys are listening and hear this, you'll probably know because um, it'll be three o'clock on Friday, but yeah, I think Orlando Brown really should look at somebody like Schwartz, a guy who was at the top of his game and one back injury. And that was it. I think you're up a great point, man. I think kind of when you look at it, um, Mitchell Schwartz, as you said, was an iron man. I mean, he did rarely got hurt. He continued to do everything he could do to stay in league healthy, always ate healthy, was always trained, got his body regimen and everything. And he was always good to go. But like you said, man, that back injury was kind of it derailed his career. And when you're kind of looking at this um, um, Orlando Brown situation, it's kind of like, well, maybe you want to take make the money. Uh, looking at, however, comes to Orlando Brown, the Chiefs did not pay Tyreek Hill top wide receiver money. If they're not going to pay Tyreek Hill top wide receiver money, then there's no way the Chiefs are going to play sorry, pay Orlando Brown top left tackle money. That's just my opinion. They're trying to figure out how they're going to sign people, trying to work the cap. But when you look at the situation, it's very, very confusing because there's so many different um, uh, different factors that come along with it. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Okay. When it comes to left tackle, that is a very important position regardless. I mean, it's, it's, it's a position that it really saved Mahomes last year. And, you know, look how many times he got sacked the year prior without him. Okay. Look how many times he was running for his life. So, and you got to remember Mitchell, I mean, um, talk about Mitchell sports, but uh, Orlando Brown switched positions, something he hadn't played since college. And he only allowed two sacks the entire season. So when you really look at the grand scheme of things, you got Trent Williams, and then you've got that dude in Philadelphia. I can't think of his name. Jason right Peters? I think so, yeah. Uh, think so. so you got a $23 million a year guy, top paid in the NFL for left tackle. And then you have a the second highest paid is a dude in Philadelphia at 18.9. So Trent Williams is 34 years old this year. Okay. They signed him to a five-year deal at 33, at age 33. Orlando Brown's going to be 26 this year. So, and I know this, Mahomes loves him, and I know he wants him. So he wants him to stay. I would pay him 23. I would pay him 23.5. 
there there's rumors going around that he wanted 25 million a year supposedly uh from what i'm understanding that's not true um he wants to be in the realm of the highest paid which would be a trent williams kind of deal i know what the chiefs offered him and he's got a handler if you will telling him to go for a little bit more money but what he really wants is more guaranteed money and Mm. uh I think they will try to figure out a way of getting it done because Mahomes wants him there. Now, these guys are really good friends already. They hang out outside the field um, and they don't, it's not because of football. Uh, they're just friends and he loves Kansas city. So, and all, all the talk about him sitting out and he's not going to play week one, blah, blah, blah. He's not a stupid man. He knows. Okay. Look, Let's just get into this really quick about this holdout bullshit that everybody keeps talking about because it's frustrating. If you really consider the fact that all these players that have held out in the past, Le'Veon Bell, great example, one of the best running backs in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years, he holds out a year, his career went to shit. Now he's a rapper. Okay. What happens is, is that when you, you're kind of damned if you're doing you're damned if you don't because you don't have an agent similar like Lamar Jackson has his mom um and then Orlando Brown had himself if you don't have an agent then sometimes certain teams will take advantage of you if you do have an agent then you have an agent that will also take advantage of you because he wants to make more money the more money the player gets the more money the agent gets it's kind of a twofold situation then you have somebody in your ear saying, you're 26 years old. You're the best left tackle in football. Regardless of what anybody says, you deserve $25 million a year. We are not going to be the pushing point on that market. Not going to happen. But is he worth 23-5? Yes, he is. He allowed no sacks on Lamar Jackson, and he allowed two on Mahomes. In a different That's position. pretty good. Okay, so you got to pay the man. But you got to, you can't, you don't want to be that guy that pushes the market. The difference between Tyree Kill and uh, OBJ is that Tyreek is replaceable. I know his, not his speed, not his uh, athleticism to a degree, even his ability, his danger factor is not replaceable. But you can fix that problem Sim similar to what we've just done with adding great players and throwing the 360 on everybody else that was used to triple teaming Tyreek, double teaming Kelsey, and then hoping D Rob catches a pass or hoping somebody else catches a pass. But we did a 360 on everybody. Now we got big body wide receivers. Everybody else went after these small corners and small safeties to catch up with Tyreek, which didn't work out for them because he's no longer in our division. Now, We've got all these big guys that can still catch that are learning the system very well. We drafted very well with wide receivers. That's a different position. You can't just go out and find a left tackle in the draft. That's going to be as good on a dime like Orlando Brown is. So my opinion is, I think they probably will try to say to get him done by tomorrow. Um, from what I'm hearing, they're, they're trying, but even if they don't and he plays on the tag, I don't think he's going to hold out from what I've heard from other people that aren't uh, media. He's not going to hold out. And he, he may not, now he may not play, he may not go to training camp just to try to prove a point, but if he does don't that, players gonna, get fined though, if they don't go to the training 50 camp, grand, I think it's 50. Well, grand a day. No, well, here's the thing. He won't get fined because he hasn't signed his franchise tag yet. Oh. So because he hasn't signed his franchise tag, he's technically not on the roster. So he, he can miss, he can miss these things. And now if he, if he doesn't sign it, then we still, the chiefs still have like dibs on him, right? Nobody else can come take it. Mm-hmm. No, but, he can't be taken, but right. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't sign the franchise tag, he can't get fined because he's technically not on the roster. Well, I don't know how that I'd have to look and see the rule books, but I know this. I, I, well, I don't know this. I want to find out. I think he has to sign the franchise tag before, or at least of the day of training camp. If he wants to, um, I could be wrong, 
Um, but I think he has to sign it. Or there's some kind of stipulation of it. I'm not sure. He may get fined for not signing it. Maybe that's what it is. But regardless, if he signs it and he doesn't show up, it's 50 grand a day, I think. Um, if I yeah, then the right. recent CBA, they made it more difficult for players to hold out on training camp and right. they what the what nfl teams used to do is they used to when they would just when the player would come back and sign their extension or do whatever they were doing to hold out the team would just wipe away those fines so the fines didn't actually occur uh-huh. that teams aren't allowed to do that anymore no, that's in the not. new oh wow they're not so, that makes no sense they should have so, just tried to sort of that was it of... yeah that was in the new cba that's yeah. what that's one of the things they made it more difficult for players to hold out on is they removed some of those quote-unquote loopholes yeah. for players to be able to hold out because if you're a star player and and your left tackle he he's a star player on this team yeah. i mean he's a guy that came in and and held down that you know that side we can argue if he's the third or fifth best mm-hmm. left tackle and but if you're really if you're picking sticks here to choose if he's the third or the fifth left tackle, the guy's a star on your team. Yeah, that's true. So, um, you know he's his franchise tag is about sixteen and a half million. Sixteen point nine, and then he's guaranteed a million two or a million three. So I think it's a total of seventeen point eight when it's all done. Yeah, and mm. then if he now my my <clears throat> question is, I don't if he. If he doesn't get, if he doesn't sign it, and I guess this is all hypotheticals, which will get blown away in like 24 hours. If he doesn't sign it, does he get franchised again next year? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's a great question. If yeah. I, if, and personally, I think that's it. If he doesn't sign tomorrow, I don't think he signs the next off season either. I think he gets franchised again. Now that's a good deal for the Chiefs because mm-hmm. that would only bump it up. Another like three million. Well, it depends so, on the market, but yeah, three to five it, million is where it was. Yeah, so yeah. so then you're right back to where, you know, you where started. you started <laughs> for yeah. the next year. So mm-hmm. even if he if he, you know, doesn't sign it, he he plays with the because the guy's not going to hold. You're throwing out sixteen million. You will never get that money back. Oh no, no. Yeah. So and he's watched it happen too many times. Look, Le'Veon Bell lost his career. AB lost his career. All these guys that held out and ended up, you know, Chris Jones was kind of an anomaly because he, he you know, signed really wanted him and he signed, but mm-hmm. it took him a year, but he signed. Uh, the point is, is that when you hold out a year and say, if you don't play, they you know, sit on your ass for a solid year. Every team out there is going to look at you a different, in a different light. And it, most guys lose money when they do that. Not only that, he's losing a year of career stats that he would want. I mean, he's not a dumb guy. He's not an ignorant guy. He just, and it's a domino effect. I mean, you know, when you got somebody in your ear telling you this, that, and the other, and then they pump you all up and they get you all excited on a third, as a third year player. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, shit, no other team is going to offer me $25 million a year. Why am I asking the team that I love to play for for it? So you have to weigh everything correctly. And it's it's look at Lamar Jackson, a great example. Do you think for one second he wouldn't be signed right now if last year he would have been signed if he would have had an agent? Because they didn't really know. See, it's kind of how the, the how I look at the Ravens situation, and this is how I'm looking at this one, and I hope uh, Orlando looks at it this way. Lamar Jackson gave them too much time to see what his faults were. That's fair. And when you do that and you give somebody too much time as a rookie to find out, oh, shit, maybe this guy isn't what we thought he was. Maybe he's not worth, wow. Excuse me, guys. I just had a big thunderstorm that never happens here. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. But you're good. Maybe he's not worth the quote unquote elite quarterback money. Then he's going to go out and he's going to try to get it from another team. And then that other team is going to say, well, wait a minute. If the Ravens weren't going to pay you, we've all seen what you've done these last year, year and a half because you didn't sign a contract and they didn't sign you. Then they're going to go, he's going to go somewhere else, try to get the money. They won't pay him. They may offer him less. Then he's going to come crawling back to the Ravens and the Ravens are at the perfect hand held 
because then they could say, oh, well, you know, you didn't want to take this. They didn't offer it to you. So maybe we'll go 500,000 or a million less per year. It, inevitably, you lose money by being greedy. And I think when it all boils down to it, Orlando Brown is not greedy. I think he's got too many people in his ear talking too much shit and it's causing him to do this. Now, do I think he's going to come to his senses? Most likely he will. As long as there's a certain guy and I always forget his name. Um, he, he's the one that's been in his ear mainly for the most part. He's, I guess they call him his handler. I don't know what the hell he is. Um, it's, is it his agent? No, it's not his agent. It's this other guy. Because uh, I know he just because it was interesting because when we saw that Orlando Brown was looking for an agent, this who does a podcast on the hundred yard dash, that's his podcast. And he was actually saying the group chat saying he thinks the money is going to be a issue. And he yeah. was ultimately right, because when you look at it, you don't know what's going to happen. But I have a question for you guys. If you guys remember the first game, the Chiefs versus the Bengals, Orlando Brown Jr. hurt his calf muscle on warm ups. I remember that. Joe Thune ended up playing left tackle and did fairly well. So my question to you guys is that if they, if Lando Brown were to hypothetically sit out, would you guys be comfortable with Thune playing left tackle for the majority of the season? There's a reason that he wasn't drafted as a left tackle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be my, I've heard this discussion go back and forth in the hypothetical world where he's mm -hmm. not, he, uh, junior Orlando Brown jr. Is not our left tackle. What do we do? Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say, well, we can kick, you know, him over, make him our left tackle. And my problem with that is he isn't a left tackle. If he was to, if he was a left tackle, he would have played left tackle on the Patriots. And that would have been, that would have been it. Right. Like mm -hmm. if you, because that's where the money is, that's the big, that's, you know, that's where guys want to play is at the tackle spot. So he would have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, he can play it. So that's, it's good to have guys on your line that can play versatile and for a game or two can substitute in, you know, it's like having a good backup quarterback. You hope it never comes to that, but you know, you want to have a good guy that can, that can play the position. Yeah. And then, you, uh, then, then who do you, who do you put in, in, in Joe's it, place? Exactly. Yeah. Then well, what do you do? I will argue part? this point. I think we shouldn't have done a Decent job of – well, they've done a pretty good job of bringing offensive tackle talent and just offensive line tackle talent in general coming in. I feel like they could bring in someone, kind of have them kind of be in the background waiting, and then Andy Reid and them could have them ready by week seven, week eight, week, even pushing to week ten for that stretch. So I think it's very possible, but the issue is what if those – what if that doesn't happen? We've seen two seasons where the Chiefs have had issues with offensive line, where injuries have come – very prevalent and hurt this team so let's be gonna it's gonna be very interesting to see what they can do moving forward it and in and with orlando brown doesn't start well here's something else that uh came kind of through the grapevine too is that uh fisher's name was brought up again um within the organization and i don't know if that is a just a hypothetical or if that's something that they're considering in case but i don't know if that's such a great idea uh he did do well last year with indy but i don't know that that would be a great idea to try and replace orlando brown with him i'm sorry but i just don't know they got rid of him for a reason he's now 32 years old um i don't know if that's a smart move but i don't think i i i, I just don't think he's going to be stupid enough to listen to Jamal Brown and say, okay, uh, yeah, I know you're telling me I'm worth this kind of money, but apparently no, the other 30, you know, there's 32 teams in the NFL that don't believe I am at this point. Do you guys and, think the Chiefs could possibly trade him for picks? Oh, if they it doesn't work out. I, I, I want to, I'd push back on the Eric Fisher point yeah. uh, a little bit here. And the fact that like, I, uh, Caleb, Caleb uh, announced this for the like, back me up on this. I have not been the world's, um, what to say, top fan of Eric Fisher. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly because he was a 1 1 pick. Yeah, Caleb, you're laughing. <laughs> well, uh, man, we've I've known too you for years. I'm, yeah. I'm laughing too um, because me and Caleb have had this conversation. <laughs> like, I look, I was, a, he's a good, good offensive tackle. And, you know, when something went wrong, you know, I feel like there was always an extra pay, like the, the new, the broadcast would always pay extra attention to Eric Fisher because he was the one, one. So anytime he messed up, 
Plus, when you get a holding penalty against the Pittsburgh Steelers on the goal line in a playoff game, that always, you know, sticks with me. But, see, I'm the same way. So don't 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 feel like you're uh, the now, odd man out here between the yeah, two because I've been the same way for a long time. So he might have redeemed himself with the uh, two Bud Light uh, chugs in the playoff game. I don't know if that I don't know if that evens out. Uh, I saw those billboards around Kansas City for like the next yeah. uh, 18 months, but. I think it it won't be it wouldn't be a horrible thing to do because one uh, it was a, an Achilles thing is a really it it takes a while to mm-hmm. you know come back from that um, that ends and, back and yeah and so but the fact that he played um, a full season with Indy and was productive that leads me to believe that he can you know uh, now you're looking a year and a half almost two years out from that injury that leads me to believe you could be a you could be a workable left tackle here in the um, NFL. And especially because the Chiefs line is already really good around you. We don't need you to be the guy. You know, the mm. there's that saying, you know, the a chain is only as strong as weakest link. Well, well, if if Orlando Brown is the strongest link and we take that link and make it a, a meh with Eric Fisher. You still got a pretty good chain. You still That's got a true. pretty good offensive yeah, line. It's true. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it would be the worst thing. I don't want it to come to that. Um, the only reason I would really want it to come to that is so I can make jokes during the broadcast. But, you know, I think <laughs> we obviously have a solution here. Um, yeah. I think he's playing personally. I think he plays this year. I don't know if they get a long term deal done uh, before tomorrow. It just seems like the timeline doesn't match up. It took him until the beginning of June to get an agent and such a big deal to me takes longer than a month to come together on top of all the other stuff that a chief's front office has to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, it's similar to like the Chris Jones situation. I mean, you know, he held out and then he played and then we, Caleb and I knew this long before it was going to happen, but uh, he ended up signing his deal you know, the next off season. So it just, it's going to have to be a give and take on both sides. I know Veach has got a lot of pride and that's fine, but the last thing you want to do, and I will say this because it will happen. The last thing you want to do is piss off Patrick Mahomes and it will piss him off. I know this to be 110% true. So somehow or another, they want to keep him there because the last person you want to piss off is Mahomes. And uh, I know for a fact that he is very, very uh, fond of him, not just on the field, but off the field. And he knows that with this brand new offense that they just put together, they are going to need the best offensive line they can get. And Orlando Brown at that position, it sucks because that is the upper echelon of the offensive line. You need the upper echelon of players. And, and that's the, really what he is. The Chiefs had, if you take away the first four, and I, we love to do this as sports fans. If you take away this part, yeah, it was yeah, really yeah. good. But if we take away the first four weeks, the first month of the season, where the Chiefs were obviously had their offensive woes going into the mm-hmm. year. I mean, as Chiefs fans, we were panicking uh, as like, what is this team? This is not the team. They were, they were, they had like four in their first seven games, they were like three and four. Yep. Um, and so we were panicking about just everything that was going on. It took them about four weeks to really gel in that offensive line, which makes sense. I mean, you've got guys that had never played. The entire offensive line was new. It's not like you had you didn't have a veteran stance in the room like this is how we play. And Andy, mm-hmm. it was the entire new system. And and it, you know, not to not to take anything away from Patrick Mahomes or anything, but um, part of sacks and pressures are sometimes on the quarterback. And we as football fans, I think tend to forget that Yeah. because if a quarterback breaks the pocket and you're a tackle and you've got your guy in front of you and your quarterback is moving, is booting out behind you and the defensive lineman sees the quarterback moving out of the pocket. Well, now, that defensive lineman has an opportunity to swim outside because as a lineman, you're not supposed to block to that side of the pocket. You're not, that's not how your feet are set. It's not how your shoulders are set. So the defensive lineman can do that. 
And now you've given up pressure to Patrick Mahomes. So there's some of that too. And that's why it's important to keep a offensive line together with a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, because they will understand how he moves. This isn't Madden. You can't just go and get like the 89 overall ranked offensive lineman and put him in and it'll work. You need guys to come together and to work for a long period of time. And of course, you know, the NFL stands for not for long league. So you're going to have guys rotating throughout Patrick Mahomes career, but the longer you can keep a really, really good offensive line together, a group of guys together, the better. And you look at how, and you think about it, Joe Tooney's the oldest guy on the offensive line line. So the way I see it, and you're exactly right. Plus with Mahomes, the difference is, is that they practice what he does on every play. So, and also he has hand gestures and he makes, he has different uh, signals he has that he calls subtle out. hints, subtle hints that he uses when he is going to roll out of the pocket and he lets the offensive line know, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Even in the middle of a play, he did that with wide receivers. And that's part of the reason why you saw such an issue at the beginning of last season, Caleb and I, I think we're the only two people in the kingdom that weren't panicking because we knew what the issues were. And we saw where the problems were coming from. So we kind of just said, hey, everybody just relax because this is going to take a little time to gel, number one. Number two, you had some other issues that were going on internally. So it just took a little bit of time, especially with Andy getting sick the way he did. And I still am not going to bring what the reasons were because that's on him if he wants it to come out. But uh, there was a lot of different moving factors that caused that you know, first seven games to look the way it did. 50% of it was offensive line gelling and then 50% of it was other things, but at, you know, they changed the way Mahomes played the game. They wanted him to be a pocket passer and he wasn't calling plays. I mean, we could, the list goes on, but regardless of how you look at it, you keep your offensive line together because they know the quarterback, they know the system. It took him a little time. Look, you got a guy that just came out of, playing right tackle for one year in the NFL moved to left tackle in the NFL and allowed two sacks. I don't know that you could find somebody else that would be able to do that. And then also to step into our offense and understand Patrick Mahomes the way he does already. So it would be almost stupid to let him go. That's just my opinion. And if each does let him go, it's, I think, this will be the first time you'll ever hear me say Veach was stupid for letting him go because I've yet to put Veach down for anything. But this would be a dumb move, in my opinion, to let him not mm. let him walk or not sign him to a long term deal because we need him. You know, if you want to protect your five hundred million dollar guy, keep the guys that know how he plays, keep the guys that have learned it. You can change I- your offense, but you can't change your offensive line and expect him to stay safe. And I agree with you there, J.P. and Quinn, because you need to have continuity. You need to have the same stuff happening for your team because we've all seen the Chiefs teams of old where they had people coming in and coming out, no consistency, and there's all these issues that come about. But I really think that the Chiefs will be able to figure it out, and I really think Orlando Brown will be with the team moving forward in the future because, as J.P. said, him and Holmes get along very well. And this is a winning team. He's not on – Orlando Brown's on another team that's kind of wasting away his talent. He's on a team that's going to at least make it to the AFC Championship game or the Super Bowl every single season. So I think yeah. everything along those lines will be fine from that area. And but he knows move that. On to, You're 100% yeah. right, Caleb. And the last thing I'll say about it is he fucking knows that. Excuse my language, but damn. I mean, he's not stupid. He knows that, yeah, the Jets may offer him $25 million a year. Where the hell are they going to go? Where are the Browns going to go this year? nowhere they got oh by the way for everybody out there and i want to bring this up really quick for everybody out there that said that there was no way in hell that deshaun watson was going to play this year at all you're wrong they're giving him a 68 uh, 68 week uh suspension from what i from the last i heard and hmm. you know i have people in cleveland so uh, no, from we'll what see I what happens unless that woman that is the quote unquote investigator and trial and jury for him within the NFL pushes harder. He's going to get six to eight games. Well, we saw a report come out a week or two ago that we'll hear something probably before training camp. So it's just one of those things. We'll just have to keep watching and figure out because I think 
once all that team figures out the Chiefs and Browns are going to be going at it. Yeah. But yeah, how do you guys – Jackson. How do you – Oh, you're good. Sorry. I mean, you're good. Go how do you guys feel about the whole Tyreek Hill situation? It's like every time we go open Twitter, <laughs> every time we turn on our TV, there is something else that Tyreek Hill says that everyone's just like, what in the world is going on? Uh, Quinn, I'm going to start with you. How do you feel about this whole situation? Because the last time we had <laughs> you on, it was interesting, and there's just more that continues to come about. How do you feel about all this? Man, my man, I think, first of all, I think we should, uh, in Kansas City uh, and in the kingdom, I think we should start calling Tyreek Hill Tyreek Plateau because uh, my man's career went up and has flatlined. Um, <laughs> look, I think the <laughs> – I think that um, his podcast is named Something Needs to Be Said, and something needs to be said about the stuff Tyreek Hill keeps saying. I was like, dude, look, I get it. You're in Miami. You're in Vice City. You want to get on the internet and have your words be heard. That's fine. I'm doing it. I'm guilty of it. Could you could you say some things just like correctly? Could you just could you just <laughs> can say you just something? Just be factual about can one you, fucking can thing. You, yeah. <laughs> could you just say something that I don't have to spend my time reading about or talking about or hearing people on sports radio talking about? I know it's the slow off, you know, slow part of the off season, but I would appreciate it if I could spend more time talking about other things that that are involving the NFL and other sports. I would listen to NBA talk uh, before I want to hear more about Tyreek Plateau's life experience comparing him to other people. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, man. I mean, look, Tyreek's going to be Tyreek. He's always been a little outspoken, and I'm not going to get into too much of this because I know a little more than I should, but... I will say this. I know for a fact that he has told people that he made a giant effing mistake, his exact words. And he didn't think the two and a half million dollars a year was worth it. So yes. Did he want to retire in Miami when he was done playing football? Yes. For all the people out there that read articles saying that he wanted to go there and that's the only place he wanted to be, blah, blah, blah. That is absolutely not the case. He wanted to retire in Miami. Now, let's get into his podcast situation. He is going to say things to pump up his team. That's what you're, that's one, that's what you're contractually obligated to do. But also, why wouldn't he do that when he's not playing or, or when he's playing with that team and he's not playing for the team that he just left? JP, Quentin, he said, and I quote, the 2022 Dolphins are the same team as the 2019 Kansas City Chiefs. I know. An offense that was literally one of the best we've ever seen. A year coming off, Mahomes throwing 50 touchdowns, 5,000 yards. Now, Grant, Mahomes had half those numbers and touchdowns, but he led some masterful comebacks. There is no way on this world that Tua Tagovailoa would have been able to come back down 24 to nothing with 10:35 left in the second quarter of the division round playoff game at home. And then I don't think he could have done that. No, I don't think so no, at all. No, no. And not only that, look, God, how can I say that? you're making me bite my tongue, Caleb, because of everything you just said, I'm trying to bite my tongue. It, it just makes that, no look, logical sense though. It's like, well, I when you look at these but, two teams. You have a team that won a Super Bowl, and then we have to see what this team does. The Dolphins probably will make the playoffs, but I don't see them making a deep run unless something crazy happens. Well, I, I just don't understand when I'll I just keep go back hearing to what these I things, told you guys comments. off air. That's all I can keep going back to is what I said off air. And I'm not going to say it on this because I, I'm not going to do that. But uh, it's just not good to say. But I'll just put it this way. He knows he made a mistake. He is pumping up his team. He's contractually obligated to say good things about his team and If he wants to say negative things about the Chiefs or try to compare the two, he's he's making himself look kind of ignorant. But in the same aspect, it's good ratings for him and his podcast and his brand after football. And that's all he's really trying to accomplish. Um, There's other things that I know and that you guys know now that uh, are contributing to this crap that he's spewing. But. That's okay. I mean, it, it is what it is. It, it's, it's part of every business, every major business transaction, I, I guess you could say, or 
however you want to word it, but it, it's just part of life. And I think everybody's reading a little too much into it. And I have a weird feeling that he will end up being a chief after this, maybe before the three-year contract is up. Would you guys take him back if you were, say, you're Red Veach and say Tyreek Hill, a couple years down the line, they decide to part ways. Do you got, Would you guys take him back or would you continue to roll what you have? Because I would say, hey, I wouldn't mind adding him to the group we already have, but for him to have 60, 70% of the snaps, I don't think that's an option anymore. You got to no. spread the ball around. You can't no, just get up to two guys. What, what do you guys feel on that? Quinn, I want to hear from you first. Okay, well uh... – I think, first of all, obviously this depends on like the wide receiver situation, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'd say if we're in this hypothetical scenario, I want to say, let's say we have a very similar room than we do right now. No superstars, but a lot of really good. I would Mm -hmm. still say no. And my reasoning behind this is how old Tyreek Hill will be. Um, If we're, if we're looking three to five years down the road, you know, Tyreek Hill is an amazing talent, not because of his speed, but his quickness. And those are two different things. Speed is just how, is how fast you can finally get to quickness is how fast you are at off the jump getting to those speeds and how fast you can change direction that the quickness is what makes Tyreek Hill so good and so unique. So he's not going to have that in five years. He may have it for the next two years. He may have it for him. Hell, he may only have it for one more year. He may have already, he may already be losing it because of his age. We, yeah. we have to wait to see that. So I, I don't think so because I think his top asset is going to be gone. And I think that's why he wanted such a long contract was to, mm-hmm. was to get, you know, some money on those final years. I will say this. If, um, if, if, Tyreek Hill might be correct about this. If Tyreek Hill is comparing the Kansas, the 2019 offense to the, the, the Dolphins offense, hot take moment. I think he is correct that Tyreek Hill will have the same year that he had in 2019 that he's going to have here. Here's, here's what Tyreek Plateau's 2019 stats were. He had a total of 860 yards, 58 receptions with 89 targets and seven touchdowns. That sounds like a Dolphins lineup to me. Yeah, you're right. I, so I, I where you're coming from. Tyreek yeah. Hill will have similar production in 2019. Lock it in now. Good for him and good for the Dolphins offense. Congratulations. Yeah. Third, that's $30 million dollars worth of offense right there. Yeah, yeah, 800 yards and eight, seven, eight touchdowns. I think you're right. I, and I actually agree with you. And we talked about this on prior shows that I didn't think he was going to have near the numbers, near the stats that he had with Kansas City, you know, after 2019. But he complained that he wasn't targeted enough at one point during one of his podcasts. He had 111 receptions, if I'm not mistaken. So He was target number one the team, but he also had the number one drop passes. Yeah, yeah. And interceptions one, caused by him, too. Exactly. So well, It's a give and take. It's a give and take at? either way. And well, he you- also had some injuries, and there was things that have come about with his calves and – with his quads, uh, his heel, we can, I mean, the list goes on, but he, I, you know, he's, what is he on a three-year contract, right? Yeah. Three years, three years 30 million, 30 I million years. So yeah. here's the thing. If he left there next year and he was healthy by next year, I would say bring him back, but his targets would definitely go down because I have a feeling it's good. If you, okay, look, if you add him back to this team that we have right now and we kept the same wide receivers and even just say, we may not have Juju, but we got everybody else. I think you're going to have such a spread offense that nobody could really, you can't really double and triple team him as much. So he is going to, his stats will come back up. Uh, I don't believe that he is going to be that perennial player five years from now. He could be, I mean, there's players, there's wide, let me look at Jerry Rice. He played until he was 38 years old. I think different skill set though, different skill set. Correct. It doesn't necessarily mean Tyreek can't play that long. It just means that his style of play will have to change because again, like you said, 
you know, his bilateral movements, his ankles are going to finally probably wear out to a degree. And I think it's important that you brought up those injuries he's had because as he's progressed further into his career, he's had more of those. Mm -hmm. Oh, today's my hamstring. You know, now I pulled my left one. Well, if you pull your left one, odds are you're going to pull your right one because you've been compensating on it. Now it's Mm -hmm. my ankle. You know, he's had these little nagging injuries, which has caused him to miss. He's he's been pretty good about making, you know, playing every game. Um, He's only missed. He's missed less than 10 games in his uh, career, but it's how mu- how productive was he, you know, in each one of those games. We know that players will go out, and because Tyreek Hill demanded the defense to shift so much, it was productive for him to be out there, you know, at 80% because teams were scared of 80% of Tyreek Plateau. Yeah. So, you know, I just – and three years from now, I just don't see him having the same skill set as he does right now, or even as last year at some point, because of what he's capable of, his quickness is going to, to, to tear off. Yeah. He's going to be 29 years old. So it's not like he's still 24. He's 28 right now. And he's going to be 29. And that's when players start to hit that wall. I mean, that's what we see with running. That's when we see running backs hit the wall. It's at Mm -hmm. 30. And what do running backs, you know, what's their skill set? quickness and speed. Yep. That's what Tyreek Hill has. Tyreek yeah. Hill has a very, you know, running back s skill set. Now he was he was able to to uh, be really good at jumping for the ball, and he had a really good ability to find the ball. That's what made him really special in the wide receiver position. He was His able to build stupid. that. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, for for. For somebody uh, a that's guy, five foot eight or five foot ten, his vertical's ignorant. I mean, yeah. I got to give him that. So. I don't know. I think you're right, though. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you're, you're right. His vertical is stupid. I still remember that one play where, God, he must have come off the ground four feet and landed on his head. Come about the one against the Texans yeah, Super Bowl man, season? Right in the middle of the right in the middle of the field and landed on his head, jumped up, did a dance, and walked off. I mean, <laughs> that's that, Tyreek. That that, fe- that that catch right there will always stand out in my mind because it was just for somebody his height to be able to get as much height as he gets and also to be able to bring it down, land on his head directly on his head and then be able to hold on to the ball. I don't know. He does have, and he had prior to last year, he had great hands. I, last year was just a year that I had never seen him drop so many passes, especially ones that were really easily caught balls. Um, it was just strange. So it kind of looked to me like he was in a decline to a degree. Um, and maybe that, and well, I do know that's kind of what the Chiefs saw, and that's why they didn't want to get him thirty million a year. But mm. um, you know, if if I had my choice to bring him back in a year or two, and he was still playing at a high level, yeah, but not in the same role, not in the same capacity. So, no, I got you. I mean, when you look at it, it's going to be interesting. I hope everything goes well for him, the Dolphins. I do kind of want to see a matchup between the Chiefs and the Dolphins, say maybe in the divisional round or something, to see how he would do against the Chiefs. I think the Chiefs defense would do a good job game playing around him there. Yeah. But but as we move on, we're looking into training camps going to start basically roughly within two weeks. And this is a big time because I know many people are trying to go up to St. Joe to see what's going to happen. And we this is a different team. I mean, you guys don't have guys like Tyreek Hill anymore. We don't have guys like Tyreek Matthew. Many people are gone. How would you guys characterize this team going into training camp? Do you think there's going to be a lot of good storylines coming out? Do you think this team's going to gel more? Like, how are we feeling about this team so far? Because usually the training camp is kind of the first indicator we see, oh, football season is all basically here. Yeah. So what are you guys' overall thoughts? Quentin, go ahead. Um. Oh, I, I've – okay. Uh, I think this offseason uh, is different than the last ones because we have seen – turnover in a lot of positions you know last year the storyline was offensive line that was it and going into training camp our thoughts were who's playing what position on the offensive line how is this offensive line going to gel right that was our thought pro and that's what everybody was thinking about offensive line mm-hmm. this off season there are so many positions <laughs> and position groups that have been turned over or have had significant new additions to it. And we are, we have a general idea of roster spots. There's a lot of roster spots that have been penciled in 
quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Like we have a pretty good idea of who's playing uh, what depth. Let me give you an example, like the cornerback position, right? We we got McDuffie, who does not get enough love. Uh, I I've barely like heard any talk about uh, McDuffie uh, just in general, and he was the first draft pick that we had. Everybody goes mm-hmm. to Karloftis, and yep. which is which is you know great. The guy, everything you hear about him. He's like a, you know, he's got a great backstory. I'm sure if the guy, if the guy plays at a, you know, Pro Bowl level, the guy's got to have a movie made, you know, for him. That's the kind of storyline he has. Um, but cornerbacks got a storyline. The defensive, I mean, like the safeties do. You know, we we signed Justin Reed. No more Matthew. How I love is, the Justin Reed signing, by the me way. Me too. I, I really, I do. Good. Uh, we've got Thornhill, you know, how is he going to play? There is Great. no more Dan Sorensen, which I, uh, that helps me. Fall. I count when some people count cheap, I'm going to count the amount of plays that, um, there's no Ben Neiman and, uh, Daniel Sorensen on this roster for when yeah. I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're exactly so right. there are no more nightmares about that. And I yeah. So. And then even on the offensive side, you know, we've got the wide receiver position is a huge topic because we know who's making this roster on the first five spots. We don't know how they're going to be used. The running back position. We know Clyde's making this roster, but really anybody past Clyde, they're all cuttable. All of their, their, uh, if you look at what they're making, all of it is for NFL standards. It's pretty cuttable. So how's this running back core going to come together? That, so to, to long, long uh, answer to your question, Caleb, there is there's so many storylines about position groups on both sides of the ball and not just – offensive line yeah I what's your think, oh, so go JP no I'm sorry I just think that they've that from everything that I've heard they have gelled very well together so far most of the guys including NBS has picked up the um, playbook very well and they are minimizing some of the plays and then they're Andy's digging deeper for other plays with the bigger wide receiver set as far as the defense is concerned, I think we've upgraded in some areas, a lot of areas. I don't know that the Tyron Matthew situation, I still would love to have him here. Um, I do love the Justin Reed signing. I think that's a great signing. You know, if you're going to replace a Tyron Matthew, he would be the guy I'd want you to replace him with. But uh, I don't think it's going to be as bad as everybody assumes it's going to be i still think we're going to be an asc championship team and the reason i say that is just simply because they have done so many things to throw every other defense off nobody's going to be able to know how to cover us now when you say they're not going to be as bad could you be more specific on that when i say that i mean like drop passes um Mm. you know just the turmoil things of that nature there was a lot of turmoil last year on both sides of the ball, inner turmoil, not within so much of the players, but players and coaches. So two coaches in particular, one's gone, one's here, but he's basically a stand in. Um, I think you're going to see a team that is very, very happy with each other again, like they were in 18, 19, even 20 for that matter, the beginning of 20. And I think that's going to make a huge difference in how they play because when you're, when you have continuity and you have, people that actually care and love to be there. That's going to make a huge difference in how you play. Last year was not indicative of what an Andy Reid team is like. And there was just so many different variables and things that happened last year. It just, nobody can base anything off of what went on in 2021. I'm just going to put it that way, because this is a totally different football team, different attitude, guys that care about each other, guys that want to be here. And Andy's back full strength and we got and we got i think matt Nagy is a great addition so another offensive mind just yeah. kind of another guy in the room that can have some plays which is really good and i think he came Mahomes, up with some crazy plays too bro oh yeah Mahomes he's in a comedy saying he had when when he was there with alex smith is saying he had some really good plays that were really well really well thought out and that's important because you're going to come to a point where you're going to need a trick player. You're going to need some type of play that's going to help you win games. As we saw Wash with the Chiefs and Super Bowl, Mahomes figure that play out and it working. So you always going to kind of need those things to help you because there's going to be moments in games where it's like they need to play or they need to get this first down. Yeah. And sometimes season has come down to one play. Those five seconds, five to seven seconds of play last, 
that's the that's your whole season right there. Yeah. Or thirteen seconds. Yeah, that's true. Yep, that's true. Thirteen seconds. Yep. Actually, three plays, three plays, (laughs) three plays in thirteen seconds. And let's actually let's take a moment to talk about that. Was that probably the greatest drive you've ever seen in your life as a football fan in general? Ever. And I've been watching football a lot. Probably. Yeah, I I know I'm bolder both you guys together. So, yeah, uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a drive put together so well and play and it just executed so well as that one was. And I've watched a lot of football. You know, I think that play, though that that drive would have been more into Chiefs history if they would have made the Super Bowl last year. Not even mm-hmm. necessarily won the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. but if they just would have made it. You oh, know, yeah. I think the Grim Reaper thing would have lived on uh, oh, yeah. more than it has. Uh, I would love for that nickname to stick, but and and we remember that game like it was the AFC Championship game, mm-hmm. but that was a divisional round. So like yeah. when you think about it, you're like, oh, that was just a divisional round. That is talked about that game and now recency bias, obviously, as one of the greatest playoff games of all time. Yeah. And it might be like really like here. And, you know, I'm sure in, you know, five to 10 years on the NFL network, they're going to play that game and, and one of their countdowns as the best playoff game of all time. I don't know oh, where it ranks. I'm not old enough to rank playoff games. And I sure as hell, don't think any other Chiefs playoff game is going to go on there, at least not for the Chiefs side of things. There's a lot of uh, Pittsburgh and Baltimore, a uh, lot the of Cowboys. Colts uh, that are going to that are going to end up on there. Uh, but from, you know, from like 85 to 2000 and well, like 19, there's there's not a lot of Chiefs playoff success mm-hmm. in that That's area. True. So. That's true. Yeah. There, and, and honestly, that 2019 season, the playoffs. That was the best. I'm, I'm going to tell you now that was without a doubt. And it'll go down in history as the best playoff run of any football team in history because of the, not only the amount of points they were behind in each game, but the amount they won by, by the end of that game and still won the Super Bowl. That's going to go down as the best playoff run and Super Bowl run in history. Uh, well, it's just, it's a very, I mean, it's a storyline. When we talk about what's the best, you know, we're really asking what has a great storyline to it. Yeah. And of course it's going to be that because you look at, they were down by, they were down by 24 and by the end of the game, they were out of fireworks, you know, like that's the sort of thing that Mm -hmm. that's, that's what makes. And it all started on a uh, fake punt. If I do remember, Hey, shout out to my man, Dan, you know, yeah, Yeah. I give credit where it's due. Hey, that's fair. It's just after that, he, uh, didn't do the great, but I, I hear you. He, I would say this when you look at that game, it just shows you that a team did not quit. And when you see 13 seconds, you think, oh, they're just going to do a one play and then they're going to do a flea. They're not, they're going to basically throw the ball around, hot potato, and see yeah. what happens. I mean, my goodness, guy like Tyreek Hill picks up 20 yards in like seven seconds. Boom. Kelsey has the understanding to basically do like I don't even I don't even know what type of route he did, but basically he just messed that up wasn't the a route. It, it was, wasn't. It, he was no. hiding in the zone. Yeah, he was hiding. Uh, in the just zone. what, which is an underrated aspect of <clears throat> any receiver, but especially tight ends because especially they do a lot ends. of those because they do a lot of those in between the in the hashes mm-hmm. uh, where a lot of linebackers usually play, and so mm-hmm. Travis Kelsey has an underrated ability to blow off uh find the weak spot in the zone and i think it's because it that's not a it's not a stat thing you know you can't look at the no you can't look at the log at the end of the game and say wow travis kelsey got you know 35 yards on on b on finding the the seam in between the linebacker zones so i think it's a very underrated thing and i don't know if there's another tight end in the league right now that is even close to do, do his ability to just find the soft spots in the zone. Yeah, Not so even Kittle? No. I'm on. being funny because yeah. we keep seeing everyone puts Kittle above Kelsey, and this that's a prime example. Kittle would have not have done that no. because he is a different type of tight end. Kelsey is this new age tight end that can move around yeah. quickly. It's basically a wide receiver. Kittle's one of those old school tight ends that can get some yards but also uh, bury people over. But the issue is he gets injured a lot. You know so, what it's called? It's called football IQ. 
I mean, it's fo- it's football IQ. That's what people they underrate Kelsey in so many ways, and it pisses me off so bad because his football IQ is off the charts, and people just oh well, he can't block. He can block very well. Oh well, yeah, blah blah blah. It's always one excuse after another as to why somebody's supposed to be better, like David Carr's bullshit that he put out. Eh, look. There's not another tight end in this game, and I don't know other than Tony Gonzalez, and it's only because of stats, that there's ever going to be a tight end as good, all around good, as Kelsey is. Gronk wasn't. Hmm. I don't think he was. Yeah, he caught touchdowns. He, he, you know, he was good at knocking people over and getting concussions. Kelsey plays very smart. He knows how to spell the word cat. He is <laughs> football IQ is extremely high. Uh And he has learned to play smart and hard. And the combination of the two have excelled his career. And his career is going to last a lot longer than a lot of these guys because of that reason. And his stat line is going to be stupid when he retires. And everybody can sit back and say, well, George Kittle, well, yeah, he was injured his first three years because he's stupid and he wants to headbutt people. I love to go out and hit people. That's my favorite part of being a tight end. Okay, well, you're an idiot. Because in the new age of football, that's not what you're there for. Yeah, you're there to block. Kelsey's got an uncanning a knack, knack of taking that half second off of a defender to get a wide receiver by. And that's without getting himself hurt. He doesn't need to go head first into somebody at full speed. He's very good at taking people out without causing injury to himself and getting the play to proceed and move forward and that's something that no other tight end other than mark andrews is good at it and i think mark Hmm. andrews in my opinion if you want to rank and this is probably the most uh, a popular opinion on the planet but i think if you're going to take number one and number two tight end in the league right now kelsey mark andrews it's Hmm. been that way for the last two years maybe three so all this shit about Gronk and all this shit about Kittle and all this other shit about uh, Darren Waller. Darren Waller's been injured two out of the four years he's played. Kittle's been injured three out of the four years he's played. Kelsey's been injured once out of the nine years that he's played, and it was his first season, and then he got COVID, and that was it. Hmm. And when he did play injured last year, he played through seven weeks of pure pain and still put up numbers that no other tight end did. That's true, because didn't he have a lot of, like, I don't even know, a hand and wrist he had, injuries? His, his, his whole forearm was jacked up. He pulled tendons. He had a torn tendon in his wrist, and he still put up more numbers than any other tight end in football. Wow. Last year. So nobody's going to be able to ever touch what he does when he does, you know, in five years or six years when he retires. They're not going to touch him. Oh, yeah. Mark Andrews played uh, – he started nine games last year and ended with 1,361 yards. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's yeah. strong. That's very strong. So In an offense that doesn't pass the ball a lot. Now, I will say that it does actually kind of benefit Mark Andrews because of the way the offense is built. <laughs> it's built around those short – you know, tight end pass exactly. play actions, quick mm-hmm. things to so that does benefit him that it is a run first offense with yep. uh Lamar with Jackson. Lamar. Yep. But that's it that, that's an impressive stat line. I didn't that's realize how saying. many yeah, yards. That's why I've I've always everybody argues with me about this Mark Andrews situation, but I think he's the second best tight end in football. He's so underrated, it's pathetic. And I think he's a very humble guy for taking the criticism and the uh let's see, uh let's mention everybody else but Mark Andrews. And I think he's he's taken that with stride, but in reality, he's the second best tight end in football. Imagine if he was on a, a team that ran a spread offense. Son of a bitch, dude! If he you would can, do a, can you really imagine well. him on the other side of Kelsey? Holy mother of God! <laughs> yeah, score a lot well, of you could say that about basically any tight end, ex, you know, except like Tony Moyaki or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but damn, man! I mean, you put a Mark Andrews that's got that much skill set and that much football IQ across from Kelsey that has the highest football IQ of any tight end in football. That's insanely stupid. Good. Mm -hmm. So that's saying something because you got, I mean, when you're looking at today's game, it's so much more different than it was before. And just to seeing how everyone plays specifically, the tight end position has changed over time. 
And even kind of looking at the Chiefs when they don't really want a typical three down running back, they want a scat back, a guy that's fast and quick that can kid that can run, but it also do stuff out of the backfield. So it's interesting to see kind of how the game, the NFL game, has changed within the last 10 years. So I remember Quentin when we were fans probably 10 years ago, it wasn't like this. You saw saw some hard nosed football, but as we've seen kind of over the years with these uh, different uh, quarterbacks coming in, the more athletic ones, and then they're becoming more of a uh, doing more spread offenses. We see from college. I mean, the game has completely changed from what it once was. Oh yeah, without fail. And you know, I give credit to Tony Gonzalez and um, Antonio Gates <clears throat> because those two guys, and you guys may I don't know if you remember Antonio Gates or not, but they actually changed the tight end position in football. I will give both of them credit because in fact uh tony gonzalez had the record for a long time of the most touchdowns most yards all that antonio gates came back and actually beat him in touchdown record after he retired he came back i remember that yeah Hmm. so uh i i take my i mean i you know my hat comes off to both of those guys because they changed the tight end position and for a long time guys didn't want to do it in the early 2000s mid 2000s even the late 2000s uh but it just it gave spark to guys like Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey to do the mm. right to play the game the way it is. They saw that they saw it. They had the wherewithal to see where it was going and they they wanted to emulate those style of players. And I think that's smart on their part. Yeah, I definitely I, if you were to make like a list of the, the greatest tight end, I think Shannon Sharp. Also, it was definitely the start of that oh, yeah. transition. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. Shannon Sharp is, is is definitely a part of that. Now, when I when I was growing up, Tony Gonzalez was my guy. Uh, I have a I have a Tony Gonzalez jersey, which, <laughs> funny enough, I was in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, and I uh, what visited. The hell? <laughs> I was uh, I was in Las Vegas a few weeks ago and I visited the uh, Raiders stadium. I uh, did the tour there and yeah. me, my family and the group of friends that I was with, we uh, went in all wearing Chiefs jerseys. <laughs> so we I've got pictures of me in front of the Al Davis torch with my Tony Gonzalez jersey on. That's awesome. And um, yeah, so Tony Gonzalez, that's my favorite player. Um, he was definitely one of the reasons I started watching football. Um, I mean, my dad dragged me into it, but like I was, ex- I got excited when I saw Tony Gonzalez on the field. Yeah. Um, so Tony, so a non-biased opinion here, Tony Gonzalez is one of the, is one of the best tight ends of all time. Then you got, I think you've got Shannon Sharp, Antonio Gates is, is, should be on there. Um, then if you want to throw, I think you can kind you could make arguments for different guys after that, you know, uh, whether you want to. Uh, Jimmy Graham, uh, when he was with the Saints and Drew mm-hmm. Brees, I mean that was a that was a great matchup between those two. Uh, so if you want to talk about you know different guys along, but the the time frame there, but I think those are your three, which is funny because they all played in the AFC West. Now that I think about yeah, it, obviously Gronk, but Gronk just couldn't stay healthy for yeah. for like significant. And I think yeah, when he was healthy, nine years he was injured. So I mean, yeah, oh nice, but you know he couldn't stay healthy. And, uh, you know, my dad always says you can't make the club from the tub. Damn you know, skippy. you can't, you, you can't, can't keep people around, you know, with the phrase, Oh, if they were healthy, exactly. you can't do that. Yeah. And it doesn't work. That's the Sammy Watkins effect. It's a hundred percent. That's true. That's yeah. True. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is gonna, Aaron Rodgers is gonna learn that real quick. Yeah, I've got an Aaron Rodgers hot take now to put this on the internet. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to lead the league in throwaways. Yeah, he's got mm, no wide receivers. Yeah, he's going to lead fair. the league in throwaways. But yeah, I agree with you there. He has nobody mm. besides Sammy Watkins. He doesn't really have an, a, I, a, a wide receiver room. Sports gambling needs to be legalized in Missouri so I can place 50 bucks on that. I don't even know if that's a gambling, if you can, st- uh, you know, gamble on that. I'm, but. Oh, out here you can gamble on anything. You can gamble on when a guy is going to run off the field and take a shit. <laughs> you were so close, so close with Antonio Brown. Very close. Oh, Just wrong. some of the stuff I've seen in sports books. Believe me when I tell you that it's crazy what they allow you to bet on. I, I saw I one where on. they actually had a bet for someone going to run on the field, and the guy actually bet on it, did it himself, and won the money. Two million. So I think he won two million dollars. So I don't know if they made him 
I don't know how much he's got to do with legal fees, but he he did that. So yeah. it just kind of shows you the world world of gambling we see and those aspects. But oh, and I by think the way, just so you know, Quentin, if you go on STN Sports, you can gamble from Missouri. All you have to do is go if, if you have a card for station casinos, you can go on STN Sports and gamble from any phone anywhere in the country. That's, mm, that's dangerous. That's legalized. <laughs> just want to let everybody know that, just in case you want to know. Uh, the guy from Las Vegas would know that. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I bet, because I don't. I really don't bet on sports. I haven't done it. My father-in-law was a big better, a sports better. I don't do it. I bet on a couple. I mean, but I, I just don't. I, I never have been a big sports betting guy. Um, just simply because of the fact, I guess, maybe because I'm so close to sports, I just don't want to do it. I don't know what it is with me. I, I just don't. I don't bet on sports. You don't lose the money because anything can happen. Yeah, We've seen a lot of teams. Hey, where man, I've seen guys, honest to God. Lose money. I've watched people come out here and put $2 million on a team to go to the Super Bowl that had absolutely no shot of going. Oh, there and was a was... funny article that came out. It was – there was – 30 of the 32 teams had – uh, people that came out and made a thousand dollar bets on their team to go win the Super Bowl. They yeah. were two franchises that didn't, and it was the Bears and the Texans were the only teams that didn't have people come and make one thousand dollar bets for their team to make the Super Bowl. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Those two teams, and then you're like, wait, so somebody bet that the, the Jaguars <laughs> and the wow, Jets. they just had money to throw away at that point, and the they had Giants. Money to throw away. <clears throat> I bet on the 2017 Chiefs to go to the Super Bowl. Oh, so close. Yeah, I did bet on that and I put 500 bucks on it. Uh, that was the last time I made a sports bet, it was 2017. And <clears throat> my wife was pushing me, dude, pushing me in about, I think it was week three of 2018. She goes, You're an idiot. We were just laying in bed watching, a, watching the game. And I said, <laughs> What the fuck did I do? And she goes, you need to go down to the casino and just put a bet because Mahomes is going to go to the Super Bowl. Oh, and so I close. said, wow, I can't believe you just said that because she's just not a big football fanatic. She's gotten more into it because of me, but uh, especially over the last few years. But then in 19, I looked at it. And it was like the odds were so stupid. I would have had to put like 200 grand down to win any money because – it was almost guaranteed they were going to go and win. And the, the odds were like terrible, but in 17 and 18, they weren't that great. I should have, mm. you know, I, even if I would have bet that they went to the ASC championship game, which is a viable bet, I would have won really well, but mm -hmm. I didn't do it. So that well, now bucks, you can't do it now though. He's going to make the ACC championship game. It looks like every year. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's how out. it was looking like. So. I'm out. So I just, you know, <laughs> I think the whole $500 and losing it pissed me off. And then that Jeff triplet thing set me over the edge and I just said, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. That's a story for another time. I will tell you that, <laughs> but, but it looks like we pretty much covered everything. Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add or think we're all good? No, I just want to say this. Uh, congrats to Mitchell Swartz on a great career. I do want to end this with that because he did a great, he, 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 he was great. Super Bowl and champion, Mitchell Schwartz. Exactly. And he spent four years in Cleveland. He should get an award for that alone. <laughs> yeah, no shit to last and not want to kill somebody and spend four years. There's enough, but you know, he had a great career and he was phenomenal with the chiefs. And Oh, to your question, he is going to stay in Kansas city. Um, like live in Kansas city. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't see him going anywhere else. Yeah, he might even coach, he loves honestly. It here. He loves it there, so he's not going to leave. Um, mm -hmm. But, hey, look, the guy, the one thing I know is that his pain diminished and the nerve pain that he was having in his legs were diminished, but mm -hmm. he was smart because he said, I don't know if it's ever going to go away. And he didn't want to take that chance, and I don't blame him. He, yeah. You know, your health is, comes before anything else, and mm -hmm. he's lost a lot of weight. He looks great. Oh, yeah. You know, he did that Joe Thomas and uh, just turned out to be, you know, this specimen. And he just looks good. He's a lot healthier than his brother and a hell of a lot nicer. Uh, I'm glad he didn't get that jerk off gene that Jeff has, but um, he doesn't have it. So I, I, I'm happy for the guy. I'm glad he's retired and, and, and going to enjoy his wife and kids. So uh, our hats off to that man. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, he's a staple in Kansas City. That's for sure. But I agree with everything said, you said. A great guy. Yeah. 
So uh, with that being said, we got nothing else. We can wrap this one up and move on to another uh, edition next week. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, hey, man, Quentin, thanks for coming on. And um, no problem. You can come on anytime you want, and we will uh, be more than happy to have you. For everybody out there, what's your uh, Twitter handle, bro? Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't really have a Twitter following. It doesn't um, matter. You will. Uh, it's like just. It's like Quentin, and it might just literally be like Hugh Morris is my at. I don't think there's a lot of Quentin Morrises out there. Okay. To be okay. quite honest, I'm not a very creative person. Uh, if I'm being <laughs> if I'm being real with the chat. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> we'll uh, get your name out there. And, yeah. Um... My my at is just Quentin C Morris. Who would have thought? Oh, there you go then. Okay. So, awesome. Q everybody... U E N T I N Q U E N T I N. That's there you go, Quentin. Give him a follow and, um, you know, hopefully more things to come from Quentin and definitely give us a follow chiefsfocus.com sign up, subscribe, follow us on Instagram. We are on now five major news outlets, uh, news break, Quora, we're everywhere. You can follow us on LinkedIn if you'd like. Uh, but with that being said, we will talk to you guys next week. I hope everybody has a great weekend and peace out. See you next time, guys.